title of the series is Living Life Beyond Regret. Living Life Beyond Regret. And so I've, I've defined this, and I've said that regret is a feeling of sorrow for something that has happened. And then I've inserted parenthetically here that that could be disappointments that have happened in your life, uh, mistakes, uh, failures, losses. That could be the loss of a loved one, the loss of income, the loss of a job, the loss of a relationship, uh, missed opportunities. Uh, so many times we live life with regret, uh, but we are seeing that the Lord wants to heal us from all these things so that we wouldn't be hindered by them. Amen? And so uh, I really believe the Lord is doing something very, very special, and he's going deep and, and touching us so that we can really explode uh, into our future and not be held back by, by regret. I've said this every time, just about at the beginning of a message, that God sees our life from beginning to end. And so I've given you the visual or the picture of a train uh, that we might be in the middle of our journey, sitting in the middle of that train on a, on a car, but God sees it from an aerial view. And so he sees the beginning and the end. The Bible says that he's the beginning and the end. He's the alpha and the omega. So you might be in the middle of your journey, and sometimes in the middle of your journey, it's hard to make sense of stuff. It's hard to figure out what you're going through. You might be in a painful situation. Uh, but when God sees it, he sees it from beginning to the end. That, that is so refreshing, so exciting. And so the visual that I'm asking you uh, to have in your mind is to invite the Holy Spirit, especially in painful areas of your life uh, where you've had painful memories, and ask the Lord to heal you. Ask the Lord to set you free from, from those things. And so today I want to talk about trauma and abuse. I want to talk about trauma and abuse. And this really relates to all of us because even if you have not experienced trauma or abuse in your life, and I would encourage you to think of this from, from a ministry point of view because you definitely know somebody who has experienced abuse in their life or trauma. Uh, and so uh, it's really a part of our society. It's a part of the world. Uh, and so uh, God wants to heal all of us, but he also wants to equip us to know how to minister. And so be thinking about these. You might be praying with somebody. You might be walking with somebody uh, <clears throat> that has experienced that. Let me give you some examples of trauma and abuse. Uh, child abuse. That could be physical. I wonder if there's someone here where you experience the heartache and the pain of, of physical child abuse. Uh, what about sexual child abuse? Can you... Imagine how heartrending and how terrible that is. I wonder if there's somebody here who has experienced that. And the last statistic I saw was that one out of every three girls have experienced that. One out of every five boys ha have experienced that. So the statistics are, are very, very high. But you can imagine how not only difficult is that to get over, uh, but uh, how it can just really uh, affect your relationship with God the Father, and your relationship uh, with everyone else. And so uh, there might be somebody here that has experienced that. Uh, this could be emotional abuse. Uh, that could be something that you experience. And you know, emotional abuse can be direct, but it can also be indirect. That could happen from an absentee father, an absentee mother. Uh, maybe a father was there physically, but he was never there emotionally. Emotional abuse can happen at so many different Levels And then verbal abuse. I, I wonder if there's someone here where you felt and heard just stinging and painful words, where you were berated, where you were cursed at, where you were said that you, you wouldn't amount to anything. And so uh, trauma and abuse could affect child abuse. Uh, it could be being bullied. That's another example. Uh, it is amazing how right now in our society this has seemed to increase and accelerate. I know it's always been there, but uh, somebody might have been bullied as a child or even as an adult. You know, you can be a bullied. You can continue to be bullied by your peers or by an employer, an authority figure. Here's another one, assault, rape, torture, violence. All of these things would come under the category of trauma and abuse. Things that we often... 
it's hard to even mention. It's hard to even talk about. Uh, what about this? Uh, witnessing a death. There might be somebody here today where you, as a child, saw a grandparent or a parent or a brother or sister die in front of you. Uh, that would be very, very traumatic. Uh, having an abortion. Most of the women that I have encountered and counseled that have gone through an abortion, uh, that stays with them for years and years. It just it tortures them and plagues their, their mind. Uh, what about this one? Almost dying. If you had a near-death experience, maybe you almost died in an accident, maybe you uh, almost uh, died of an illness, uh, that can be very, very traumatic. Uh, you might be okay physically now, but emotionally and mentally, uh, you still struggle with that. Uh, here would be another one, crime. Think about this. If somebody, if you've experienced crime, if you've been mugged or robbed or somebody broke into your house, that's very, very unsettling. That's very, very uh, traumatic. <clears throat> and so you might have experienced that. Uh, what about war? War or genocide? Some of you have been in combat. Uh, but some of you might have grown up in nations where uh, there was terrible conflict, and that conflict resulted uh, not just in killing, but also in terrible things like rape and even uh, genocide. These are extremely, extremely traumatic experiences. Uh, what about natural disasters? Oftentimes when you talk to somebody who's been through a hurricane, uh, barely survived through a tornado or an earthquake, uh, that is an extremely traumatic uh, experience. And so <clears throat> these are just examples of of abuse and, and trauma. And so what are some of the, <clears throat> excuse me, what are some of the, the painful results of that? If you've been through tremendous trauma or you've experienced the heartache of abuse uh, or you know somebody that has, what are some things that, <clears throat> that happen in your life? Well, one, there's just hopelessness. There's such despair and de de depression. In fact, oftentimes when somebody goes through an abusive <clears throat> experience in their life or a traumatic experience, then they actually become suicidal. Uh, they, these are painful results uh, of that. It often leads to substance abuse. Uh, so that could be uh, alcoholism, it could be drugs, uh, it could be pornography, but it leads to, to terrible uh, substance abuse oftentimes. Uh, Self-harm, like cutting, uh, just hurting uh, themselves. It might lead to that. Weight loss, things like terrible chest pains or other physical conditions. Uh, chronic fatigue, uh, these tra traumatic things can lead to chronic fatigue. Uh, social anxiety and isolation. Uh, difficulty in relationships having trouble trusting, trusting God, trusting people, trusting the world around you. Uh, the person might feel very, very disconnected. Here's one. You might have shut off your feelings for many, many years. Shut off all of your emotions. And here's a big one, shame and guilt. Even if you were the victim, uh, there's such shame that something like that would happen and even guilt that something like, like that would happen. Or what if you're a parent and one of your children got hurt. As a parent, you would struggle with the shame and guilt that somehow that, that actually happened. And finally, reenacting abusive behaviors. Unfortunately, when somebody's hurt, sometimes they hurt other people. And so hurting people hurt other people. Uh, and so sometimes when there's abusive patterns, Unfortunately, that, that can be repeated. That can be reenacted. And so just an, as an example, oftentimes when a child imagine that the boundary lines have been crossed and there's been inappropriate behavior, inappropriate touching uh, for a pubescent, uh, prebescent uh, child, there's such confusion that then they begin to act out in certain ways uh, as they grow older, as they get into their their teenage years. These things are heartbreaking. These things are tragic. And so uh, trauma and abuse 
is really an epidemic, not just in our society, in our culture, and in our nation, but, but in the world. And so I want to start by talking about the problem of evil. I want to talk about the problem of evil, and then I'm going to talk about the promises of healing. So first, let's talk about the problem of evil. And I think we're going to just lay down a few theological uh, points, and then, and then we'll get into uh, some of the pragmatics of this. But I think this is really important. I want you to know, first of all, that God hates evil. That's really important to understand theologically. God hates evil. Evil. Listen to Proverbs 6, 16 to 19. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. That's some descriptions of the things that the Lord hates. The Bible doesn't say he doesn't dislike them. He hates them. God hates them. Listen to Isaiah 61, verse 8, out of the contemporary English version. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and injustice. So you need to know today that if you've been harmed, if you've experienced injustice, if you've experienced abuse or trauma or any way, God hates that. He hates evil. He hates wickedness. Now, what's important to realize is that none of that comes from God. I want to repeat that. None of that comes from the Lord. God hates evil. God hates wickedness. He hates trauma. He hates abuse. So what we need to understand theologically is that God is not the author of any of that. Please say amen to that. Okay, now... I won't take a whole lot of time, but when God created the world, he created everything good. But he took an enormous risk, and the risk was he gave every one of us a choice on whether or not we would follow him. He gave Adam and Eve a choice on whether they would follow him. And so true love in this regard was demonstrated through obedience, to obey God, to love God. And so he took an enormous risk by by doing that. And so Adam and Eve sinned. Now, listen to Romans 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sin. So when Adam and Eve were created, they were given this incredible choice. Would they love God? Would they follow God? They sinned, and when they did, sin entered the world. Now, let's repeat. When God created the world, he created everything good. Everything was perfect. And so Adam and Eve were in charge of the world. They had the deed to the property. They owned the world. They were in charge. Uh, God said that uh, they should be fruitful, that they should multiply, that they were in charge of the earth. And when they sinned, please listen very carefully, they signed over the deed to the property, and they gave that to Satan. That's really important theologically. I won't spend a whole lot of time on it. So every evil, every wicked thing that has happened, Satan is the one that ushered that in the world, not God. That's so important. I cannot underscore it enough. And so when we talk about the problem of evil, we realize it's because man gave up their right to rule and reign. Mankind gave up their right uh, to be in charge. And when they gave up that right, Satan is the one who ushered in evil uh, in this world. And so we understand that theologically. Romans 5, verse 18, consequently, consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. So Satan brings in wickedness, brings in evil. What we're about to see is that Jesus brings in righteousness and healing. And so, again, theologically, God created Adam and Eve. He created everything good. But when they sinned against God, Satan becomes the prince of this world. He becomes the one in charge of this world. He brings in all of the suffering, all of the evil, all of the wickedness in the world. When Jesus comes in and steps on the scene, he comes in as king to reverse the curse and to bring healing to mankind. That's really important. 
So evil enters the world. Jesus, though, will bring justice. So listen to Matthew 12, verses 15 to 18. Many followed him and healed all their sick. I want you to see all. In fact, I think we should say that out loud. Say all. Okay? So he healed all the sick, every single one of them. He'll heal all of us today. Say amen to that. So he heals all their sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my sermon, servant whom I have chosen, the one I love, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. So when Jesus steps on the scene, he starts bringing justice uh, to the earth. Now, ultimately, there's going to be justice when he comes back the second time. And so listen to Revelation 19, verse 11. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and makes war. And then Revelation 21, 1 to 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth has passed away. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. So let's review. God creates everything good, puts Adam and Eve in the garden, gives them a choice. Are you going to follow me? Unfortunately, they sinned. When they did, Satan becomes the prince of this world. He brings in wickedness and suffering. When Jesus steps on the earth, he starts bringing the kingdom into this realm. We get glimpses of that when somebody's healed, when somebody's saved, when a dead person is raised back to life. Those are all glimpses of the kingdom. Now, we still live in a world of wickedness and suffering, but one day Jesus is going to come back. We just read, he'll bring justice and war, and when he sits as the righteous judge, he will bring everything in order. The old things will be passed away. We'll be in the new heavens and new earth where there is no evil, no wickedness, no suffering, no pain. Say amen to that. So that, that explains really the problem of evil. And so sometimes people have a misunderstanding of the, of the sovereignty of God or a misunderstanding that if God knows everything, how could he allow something to happen? He gave us the right to choose. And so at a macro level, he has stood back and we're the ones that have to bring justice in the earth. And Jesus demonstrated that by stepping onto this earth and bringing healing. Ultimately, he's going to bring complete healing and restoration. There will be no wickedness. But God is looking to us as the church to bring healing, to bring justice, to bring uh, deliverance to people. Amen, church? Okay. So that explains at a theological uh, level the, the, the problem of evil. Uh, it's because we have been given a choice as mankind. Now, let's talk about the promise of healing, the promise of healing. First, there's a cry. There's a cry for healing. Psalm 34, verse 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves all those who are crushed in spirit. And so if you're here today and you've experienced trauma and abuse, this could be your cry. You're brokenhearted. But God says that he's close to you and he will save you. You have to know God didn't want any of that stuff to happen, but we live in an evil world. But now, as you ask him to come into your life, as you ask him to heal you, then he is going to be close to you and he's going to save you. Psalm 118, verses 5 to 8. In my anguish, I cried to the Lord and he answered by setting me free. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I will look with triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. Do you see that, that phrase? I will look with triumph on my enemies. I release that as a prophetic word to you today. That you're going to look with triumph on your enemies. You're going to look with triumph over the things that have, that, that have happened uh, to you. And so there is a cry of healing. And God hears your cry. God hears your cry. 
Now, what does Jesus do for us? And this is really important for us to say. So Jesus steps on the scene, and in Luke chapter 4 and verses 18 to 19, we're told what Jesus did. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. This is Jesus. Because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. To the poor in spirit. To those that are hurting. And notice this. It's good news. Please say good news. Okay. So the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to preach good news to the, pe- to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. If you're in a prison of pain today, if you're in a prison of trauma, if you're still in a prison from from the memories, he comes to set you free and recovery of sight for the blind so that you could see spiritually, so you could understand spiritually, you could open blind eyes, to release the oppressed. When the Bible talks about oppression, it's the Greek word katadunisteo. It means to push down. It means to hold down. It means to to smother. And if you've gone through trauma and abuse, I'm sure you've felt the emotions of that where you felt held down. You couldn't even breathe. You feel smothered by by what has happened. Uh, But Jesus comes to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So God is saying to you today, my daughter, my son, I want to heal you. I want to set you free from your prison. I want to open your eyes. I want to release you from oppression. And I want to give you favor in your life. That is a strong prophetic word for you. Because often when you have been victimized and hurt and abused, you feel like that nobody loved you, nobody cared, God wasn't even around. And you need to hear this strong word that he wants to give you favor in your life. And so Jesus steps on the scene and he brings With his anointing, he was the anointed one, the Mashiach, the anointed one. He brings uh, this great news to us. Listen to Isaiah 53, verses 3 to 5, talking about Jesus. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. So so please see that. He takes up your infirmities. When Jesus died on the cross, he took all of your sicknesses, all of your deformities, all of the pain in your body, and he, he carried your sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. So keep this in mind when we're talking about justice, that God is going to bring justice to the earth. When you have been abused by someone, they deserve punishment. But God is the one who punishes. Now, he starts out by taking punishment on the cross. Ultimately, he's going to bring justice in the earth, and there will be no evil in the earth. But first, he takes it on the cross. And so he, he, he carries that. He carries our sorrows. But he was pierced for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. So in the middle of trauma, in the middle of affliction, God wants to heal your heart. And this is really important to understand. You may not understand why, although I think I've explained at a macro theological level that evil is, is part of the enemy's plan, the, the wickedness of of this world. But you may not even understand all the details, but here's what God will give you, is peace in your heart and healing in your heart so that you can be free from the trauma of what what happened in your life. And so he brings brings peace uh, into into our lives. Uh, and, And watch this last phrase, and by his wounds we are healed. Would you say that out loud? By his wounds, we are healed. Let's personalize it. By his wounds, I am healed. And so this is really important that that not only did Jesus die for your sin, but he died for the hurt that you've experienced. The sin that you have done, but the sin that was done to you. When we talk about abuse and trauma, we're talking about the sin 
that has happened to you. But he took that on the cross. He took all of that pain on the cross. All of the, the, the memories that have, that have tortured you, all of that was on the cross. And by his wounds, his stripes, by his wounds, I am healed. Listen to to Matthew 9, verses 35 to 36. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Every single one. Okay, Now, that means physical, but he also healed hearts. He healed minds. He, he He healed memories. And so... This is the good, saving, wonderful news for you, that Jesus heals all, not just some, but all. He heals them them all. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. In other words, they they were harassed. They were harassed by, by the enemy, but he looks with compassion on you today. And then 1 John 3, verse 8, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Say amen. Are you starting to see this theologically? So Adam and Eve sinned, opened the door, evil, wickedness comes in the world. Jesus steps on the scene as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He starts healing. He's here to destroy the works of the devil. Ultimately, everything is going to be right when he comes back. In the meantime, we still have some evil people in the world. In the meantime, we still have people that aren't saved. And so what happens is evil continues in this earth. But what we're doing is we're bringing healing. Jesus brings healing right now for me, but I also bring healing to other people until the day that Jesus comes out back and he sorts everything out. Amen, church? And so this is the promise of healing. Now, Thirdly, I want to say this, that you're anchored in love. So you got to get this in your heart and mind. There's a cry for healing. Jesus, Jesus, what he does for us, he heals, but he anchors us in love. Uh, Listen to, to Romans 8, 35 to 39. I'm going to read this out of the New Living Translation. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hunger? or destitute, or endangered, or threatened with death? Does that mean God doesn't love you? Well, I hope I've explained it theologically. God loves you. He didn't want any of that to happen. But he's not going to go against his word. His word was that he created this world, and he gave mankind a choice. And so legally, he had to come as Jesus to set things in order. And so God didn't want any of the abuse or or the things that, that have happened. It doesn't mean that God th- didn't love us. That, 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 that question of why did this happen? Uh, well, we know it, w- it was because there's evil in the world. But, but it doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. Uh, so, so if you've been persecuted, if, you know, I, I've known people that have, that, that have struggled and, and have gone without food, that, that are hungry, the, the famines in the world, the wars that are happening in, in the world, Uh, That doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. It means that we live in a very evil world where there are demonic forces at work. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. I'm going to read that again. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will be a- ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so I know that there are some people here that you're courageous enough to say, even if stuff happened, even if there was trauma, 
I'm going to come into the loving arms of Jesus knowing that He loves me and He wants to heal me. He never wanted me to hurt. He never wanted me to suffer. He never wanted me to be abused. But He comes with His love and He's trying to step into my life right now to bring healing. That's the promise of the Lord today. He loves you so much. He never wanted that stuff to happen. And so don't have a misunderstanding of the sovereignty of God where, where God happens to know things that'll, that, that are happening because He's looking up here. But it doesn't mean that, that He necessarily allowed it. That, that's really important. Because sometimes we think, well, if God was so big, why didn't He just step in and keep it from happening? He didn't step in and keep it from happening because we gave up that right to rule and reign. There's wickedness. But when Jesus came in a physical body to bring healing, he was able to heal. Now you have a physical body, and so we are going to bring healing and justice in the earth. Say amen. A lot of times we think, well, God is so big, he could just wave his hand. He could keep it from happening. But, and I hope, I hope you're tracking with me. That, that's just actually a theological misunderstanding. Because just because he knows something is happening from up here doesn't mean that he necessarily allowed it. That happened back at the garden where evil and wickedness was ushered into the world. But now, because there's wickedness and evil, Jesus, when he was literally here on earth in a physical body, he brought healing. But now he brings healing through the body of Christ. And I, I hope and pray that uh, that I'm articulating this in a way that, that, that's helpful. And so that's the promise of healing. My dear brother and sister, if you experience trauma, if you were in the middle of a war, if you were in the middle of, uh, if you experienced crime, if you experienced abuse as a child, that was never what God wanted in your life. But there are wicked people, there are demonic forces in this world. Now, I don't know about you, but that really helps me theologically to understand what's happening. And now we can come to the Lord with healing and say, God, come, come and heal me. So let me talk to you about the process of overcoming. If you're here today or you know somebody that is going through this, let, let me talk about the process of overcoming, of being healed. First, let me mention this, some stages that, that people go through. And many psychologists and counselors agree that when somebody goes through trauma and abuse, that they go through uh, these stages in some way or another, often they first go through denial. In other words, they just refuse to admit that it happened. If it was really trauma, traumatic, so sometimes people block it out of their memory in order to cope. And then at the right time, the Lord lovingly comes and says, hey, I want to heal you from, from that memory. But oftentimes people go through denial and say, well, that, that never happened. This is really tragic. When, let's say, a child is being abused. Well, let's give a couple of examples. Let's say there's an alcoholic father, and he comes home and he beats his children. But oftentimes, even the mother, maybe out of fear, maybe not understanding, but will be in denial that it's that bad. Okay? Or let's say someone in the family is sexually abusing a, a, a child. Can you imagine the heartache of a child if they, this is happening, then they go to their mother, but the mother can't believe it? Almost in denial. Well, no, he would never do that. Because then she would have to, one, admit that she married somebody like that, and two, that, that that's actually happened. In other words, she might be a little bit to blame. You can see how the shame and the, and the guilt and, and everything just builds and builds. So sometimes there's this denial, this refuse, refusal that, that it even happened. But then usually what most psychologists will say is that then you, you, there's this realization that it happened, but it wasn't that harmful. Something, something was wrong back then. Something happened, but, but it really wasn't that harmful. It, it, it hasn't really affected me now in, in, in my life. But then after that, people usually get very angry. In other words, they're upset. Furious that something like that even happened. And maybe you've gone through these stages where you finally realize, man, the person that should have been there for me loved me. They were an authority figure. I was hurt. I was abused. 
But then there's just such anger and fury that something like that could, could even happen. And then people often go through grief. Just a sorrow that it actually happened, that you've been harmed, and that you've missed out on the beauty of innocence. And so people go through that grief process. And then finally they accept it. Accept that it happened. But here's the powerful thing. Then you can start healing. Start healing. Say, wow, this actually happened, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move toward healing. So let me give you some, some steps toward healing. And I, I just pray by the grace of God that, that, that this would, would help in some way. If you've experienced it, or if you're ministering to, uh, to somebody that, that has experienced this. The first thing is, be real with the pain and grieve what was lost. I mean, you, you have been harmed. You, you have been, uh, it, it was wrong. It was wicked. And so be real with the pain and grieve with what was lost in your life. Matthew 5, verse 4, Jesus said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And so as you grieve over that, 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 that would be the, the first step to say, Lord, this, this really hurts. This, this is painful. I, I need healing. Secondly, ask Jesus to heal you and really go to him with all your heart. Just begin to ask the Lord, Lord, heal me from these memories. Heal me from, from the pain of what happened. And go to him with all your heart. And for some of you, uh, maybe you, you got a healing quicker. But for others of you, it, it has been a long process. It's affected your relationships, affected the way you go about life. But, but, but ask him. He's the healer. Jesus is the healer. Um, you can get some counsel, but Jesus is the healer. And so you go to him, you ask him to, to heal you. Thirdly, I would suggest this. If, if you're going through this process of healing, build a support team. Build a support team. Galatians 6.2 says, carry each other's burdens. So find some safe people that can help you process the pain. What I mean by safe is somebody that you can trust, somebody that you can share with. Someone that will help you process uh, the pain. They, they have to be somebody that you can really trust. Uh, these are not things that you necessarily uh, share with, with anyone. You would share with somebody very, very trusted. But, but build a support team, somebody that can, that can pray with you, that can, that can walk with you on, on these kinds of things. And I would say this, realize that there's power in community. Realize that. I mean, in some of the places in the world like Rwanda where there was genocide that took place, one of the things that has empowered them is that they have realized that there's power in community, that they're going to heal through this together. They're going to forgive through this together. Uh, and, and so there's healing in, in community. To, so build your support team and, and realize that, uh, that we desperately need each other. You need some people to help you carry the, the burden, to help you process it, what you're feeling, to help you to pray with you, so build a, a support team. Uh, here's another one. You, you might need to get some professional counseling. Really, honestly, if you've, if you've gone through trauma, if you've gone through, through abuse, uh, you might need to, to have somebody help you sort that out. You need some professional counseling, but it needs to be godly. Uh, listen to Psalm 37 and verse 30 out of the New Living Translation. The godly offer good counsel. They teach right from wrong. And so I, I would recommend that if you're going to get counsel, that you, you get it from a godly source, somebody that loves the Lord, somebody that has a biblical worldview, somebody that can help you sort out what's right and wrong. Because you're going to have a lot of feelings. You're going to have a lot of emotions. But you, you need someone to help you sort that out. And it needs to be biblical counsel. It needs to be counsel that, uh, that you can rely on with, with God's word. But if you have been or you know somebody that's been through incredible trauma, then, then going through a process of, uh, of counseling can be very, very, very helpful. <clears throat> Here's another one. Avoid self-blame with tenacity. 
let that ring in your spirit today. Let it ring true. But if you've gone through trauma, if you've gone through abuse, what happens is there's such a blurring and a distortion of the lines that the victim begins to take on shame and guilt. If you think about abuse and a kid is being beat by their parent, uh, the child thinks they've done something wrong, thinks there's something wrong with them, but yet that parent has crossed the line. There's such a blurring of the line and a distortion of the line uh, that there, there's such self-blame then. There's such, uh, there's such self-hatred because this is happening. Now, take it, take it in, in another. What if that child is being sexually abused? So the inappropriateness uh, of crossing lines and, and the hurt that, that's happening, that child knows it's wrong, and, and yet the perpetrator is is trying to make them feel like they, they did something wrong, and so they take all that shame and the guilt. So you've got to avoid self-blame with tenacity. I'm here to tell you this today. I, I hope and pray that you're hearing what I'm saying today, but if you've been hurt, if you have been harmed, it is not your fault. You really need to hear that. If you were abused as a child, if you were taken advantage of, if there was inappropriateness, you have been harmed. It was wrong. It was evil. And it wasn't your fault, even if the perpetrator tried to make you think it was your fault. That's really important. So you've got to be tenacious that you will not blame yourself. And so that might be a process where you begin to renew your mind and say, I am not at fault. Romans 8 verse 1 Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This idea of condemned is the same thing of oppression, this smothering, this, this pushing down, this making you feel like that you're, you're terrible. There is no condemnation. Please say that, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so you have to avoid self-blame with tenacity. That might, that might take a while. That might be a process of healing. But you got to make that decision. Another one is this. Realize that healing happens in layers. Healing sometimes happens in layers, especially when it comes to uh, emotional healing, when it comes to, to mental healing. Listen to Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 to 3. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. And then he goes on to say, a time to heal. So sometimes it takes a season. It takes, it takes time to be healed from painful memories. If you've gone through the heart-wrenching, heartbreaking, uh, a traumatic experience in, 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 where you were abused in, in one way or in another, it might take time to, to be healed. Realize there's, there's a season that takes place. And so, so healing has layers. It takes a little bit of time. And there might be some time where you're, you're processing it, you're being healed, and, and you cope a little bit, and then, and then God takes you back and, and heals, and you get more and more free. But you realize that it takes a little bit of time. Here's another one that should help you. Acknowledge your progress and affirm yourself. Acknowledge your progress. So uh, sometimes my discovery has been in, in the discipleship process and counseling people, um, that, that it takes time, but they, they realize, you have to realize you are progressing. And, and so I've, I've discipled people and counseled them, and they'll get just all torn up inside because they'll, they'll feel like, well, I haven't got the victory in this area yet. No, but it's a lot better than it was five years ago. It's a lot better than it was a year ago, a lot better than it was a month ago. You, you, you're getting better. And so affirm yourself in that. Philippians 4.13, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And so sometimes even going through the process of healing is painful. As I've described it before, uh, if you've been hurt by somebody else, it's like somebody just put a sword or a knife in your heart. And the only way to be healed is to pull that thing out. But in pulling it out, it hurts. So part of the healing is, is pulling it out. And even that can be painful. And so you need to have courage to say, you know what? I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And here's a, here's a nugget I think that will help you if you're in this process. Celebrate the good things in your life. 
James 1, 17 in the New Living Translation, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father. And so this is important because when, when you're dealing with this kind of trauma, you might feel like there's nothing good. There actually is. There, there are many good things in your life. One, you're saved. Say amen. Uh, so any good and perfect gift. So look around and see the good and celebrate that. Thank God for that. Yes, there's painful things that happen, but thank God for the good that you have now. Thank God for what he's doing in you now. Celebrate that good. Because it can be overwhelming to just see the pain of the past. So celebrate the good. Here's one that's important. Take care of yourself. If you're going through this process, Hebrews 4.11, out of the Living Bible, let us do our best to go into that place of rest. When you're being healed of emotional trauma, you got to take care of yourself. So get some rest. Eat well. Exercise. Take a walk. They say all of those things really help with grief management and walking through pain. Find a creative outlet. What, what's the creative outlet that, that you could have? What that often does is get your mind off the pain and, and focusing on, on some of the good that's in your life. It's actually very biblical, but we'll say it this way. Find that place of rest. Find that place uh, where you can receive healing, where you can, uh, where you can focus on the Lord. So take care of yourself. And the last one I'll give you here is release through forgiveness. So you release through forgiveness. You release the pain the person, even the situation, you release it through forgiveness. Now, we've said this before, but I'll, I'll define it again. Forgiveness is giving up your right for revenge. Okay? So if you've been harmed today, there should be justice. Somebody should be punished. If there was a crime, they, they should be punished. But when you forgive someone, what you're saying to yourself is, I'm not going to punish them. I'm not going to go hurt them. I'm not going to go kill them. I'm not going to retaliate. You give up that right for revenge. You give up that right for, for justice. And what you do is you say, God, I'm going to give that up to you. I'm going to release that to you, and I'm, I'm going to be free from that. that. That's freeing to release. So you release the pain. You release the person, the situation. Some people are able to do this quicker than others. It might take you a while, but... This has to be your prayer that you, you pray into this and say, oh God, I want to do this. Luke 17, 1 to 2, Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come. That's the word offense, that cause people to, to be offended, that cause people to stumble, that cause people uh, to be hurt. They're bound to come. But listen to what he says, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Jesus clearly does not want children to be abused. Say amen to that. And so he's saying here uh, that, that there could be hurt and children or people could be caused uh, to stumble because of the hurt that was done to them. That, that's incredible. He says it, it would be better for them to be thrown in the street with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of the little ones to, to stumble. So in other words, Jesus is deeply, deeply troubled, grieved, and upset by the hurt and the abuse that has happened. Very deeply troubled. And everywhere he went, he healed when he was physically here on earth. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. Let me pause right here. We're talking about your individual freedom. If we were to talk about justice within the world system, and that there, if there's a crime, there needs to be a punishment, that, that's, a different, that's a different message. And so let's be clear about this, that if there was a crime, there should be punishment. But what we're saying in the individual process of being free is that we're giving that to the Lord. We're not saying that we're going to be the ones that sit in the judgment seat. 
Now, now this is important here because he says, wait until the Lord comes. The reality is, if we're really honest about this, and this is a hard truth to swallow, is a lot of the injustice won't be taken care of until Jesus comes back. I don't mean to say that as lack of faith or anything, but that's just the reality. Uh, some of you that uh, think about people that have been abused, people, uh, perpetrators, uh, yeah, maybe they were discovered with the crime, uh, but others have not been discovered. Or maybe the person that hurt you has already passed away. Okay? And, and so, so what this is getting us to here is that there will be a time when Jesus comes back and he sets everything in order, but he's going to be the one to do it. And so what, it's saying, what the Bible is telling us here is, don't judge before Jesus comes back. Let him be the judge. That's the appointed time. Again, we're talking about releasing and not being the one that sits in the, in the judgment seat. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's heart. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. And so... So you'll receive praise if you can be forget, courageous enough to forgive, to release others. He's going to give you praise for that. And he'll, he'll take care of those that deserve punishment at the right time when he returns. Okay? So we're releasing pain. We're releasing people. We're releasing situation. Now listen to this. This is important. Romans 12, verse 19. Do not take revenge, my friends but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. So we release through forgiveness. So again, to reiterate, forgiveness, if you've been hurt, you have a right for justice. You have a right. It was wrong, you were harmed. But forgiveness is giving that up, saying, God, I'm going to release that to you. I don't want that burden anymore. I don't want to punish that person anymore in my mind, in my memories, and it's affecting my whole life. Lord, I want to be free from that. So what I start to do is, I, Lord, I give it to you. I, I put it at the, the foot of the cross. I, Jesus, I give it all to you. You're the righteous judge, and then you're going to determine how and when you want to take care of that situation. But I want to be free. In other words, I want to, I want to put it on the cross. Because he took it all on the cross. He took his infirmities. He took our, our sorrows. He took all of the pain, the abuse on the cross. Jesus, I want to lay it on you. I'm going to trust you with all of that so I can be healed. So the great exchange takes place where I, I, I put it into the hands of Jesus on, on the cross. and He releases peace and healing back to me so that I don't have to be tormented and tortured by the the stuff that has happened by all the questions of, of why. No, no, I, 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 put it, I put it on the cross and I realize, you know what? All the answers are going to come at the end of the age. At the end of the age. You know, there's another verse. I, I didn't put this in my notes, but in Luke chapter 18, this is with the, the persistent widow. And she keeps asking, asking for justice. And he gives this parable. Jesus gives this parable. And he says, the unrighteous judge finally gives her an answer. Uh, he says, how much more will the righteous judge give you an answer and stand in place? And then there's a little verse, little phrase right after there. It says, but will the Lord find faith at the end of the age? What he's saying there is, will you and I have faith to receive healing now? But faith that he will bring justice at the right time. Can I, can I be courageous enough to have faith in that instead of carrying the burden and the pain myself? So again, I want to put it all onto his body, all onto his being at, at the cross and, and, and let the great exchange take place where I can, I can receive healing. Does this make sense? I'm going to close with this. I want to ask you to go to Luke chapter 5. And we'll close with this event. And I want, as I read this, I'm going to ask you to, to think about emotional healing, healing from trauma, healing from, from abuse. So we'll go to, to Luke chapter 5, and we'll start with verse 17. 
One day as he was teaching Pharisees and teachers of the law who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem were sitting there. And the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. I don't have time to talk about that, but that's the tangible anointing presence of the Lord. The power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. Even with the Son of, the God, Son of God, very, very interesting. Verse, verse 18, some men came carrying a paralytic on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. Now draw this up on your video screen. Here's a man who's paralyzed. Often trauma and abuse will paralyze you, affect your relationships, affect your self-confidence, affect you from being able to move forward. And so he, he, he was paralyzed, but think of it in terms of, of emotional healing. Now watch this. He had to get some friends. Sometimes you need some friends. Build that support group. Sometimes you need some friends to, to, that'll help you process it, that'll, that'll be there to pray with you, that, that'll be there to cry with you. Uh, get some people around you that love you enough to get you to Jesus, to love you enough to get you through the, the healing process. And when they saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now, now, I want you to think about this, that forgiveness and healing are all wrapped up in the same package. That's really important. If we're going to be healed from some of the abuse and trauma, it's all wrapped up in, in, in forgiveness. Now listen, forgiveness that we release to others so that we can be healed and, and, and be free. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law begin thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? Which is easier? They're all wrapped up in the same package. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up. Take your mat and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. Can you see how forgiveness and healing are closely intertwined? Can you see that both take place on the cross? He carried our infirmities and our sorrows. And if I could relinquish that right to anger, there's something about releasing that to him. I could receive the healing that God wants for me. Can you say amen? And so I just say again, lovingly, God wants to heal you. If you've experienced tra trauma, abuse, the Lord never wanted that to happen. You've been harmed. It was wrong. It was evil. God loves you, and he wants to heal you. And if you know somebody, you can be that person that helps bring healing to them. Amen?